Hello everybody, welcome to my talk. I'm Albert. I'm gonna tell you today about Haskell and Lua, which are two very beautiful programming languages in my opinion. And they can be used together to make even better programs. So let's start a bit about um, what this is all about and uh, what this all means. And I think the best way to understand where I'm coming from is to look at uh, who's talking. That's, um, that's me, I'm Albert, as I said, I'm interested in scientific publishing mostly. And I'm also like a huge Haskell fan, let's be honest, uh, and contribute to Pandoc for some seven, eight years now. But I'm also the current maintainer of the HS Lua package, which is a Haskell package combining Haskell and Lua. I took, I didn't write that. I took that over um, some five years ago, I think, and have um, extended it considerably in that time. If we look at the languages that are I'm talking about Haskell and Lua, we see that those are very different, at least when we take a high level view, we see that Haskell is statically typed, Lua is dynamically typed, Haskell is a compiled language, Lua is an interpreted language, Haskell has lazy evaluation, Lua has strict evaluation, so they really as different as they can be, I'd say. And of course, this means they're used in very different use cases. For example, Haskell is used for web gateways and window managers, while Lua is used for web gateways and window managers. Well, uh, yeah, more seriously though, um, the, the difference in my personal opinion is that Haskell is excellent for projects that are really complex complex systems that you may want to maintain for a long time, want them to be easy to maintain. And Lua is just great if you want your program to be scriptable and extensible and um, want to mix different parts together. And you can probably see where I'm going with this because if you want both of these features, then you may want both of these languages. And this is what this talk is all about. We look at an example first. Uh, of course, we're going to use Pandoc. Um, and Pandoc works by converting documents into its internal document AST uh, data structure. Um, it's here you have a small, uh, small example or a small snippet of what the internal data format looks like. For in, inline text, you can have either plain text or you can have emphasized text or you can have small caps and all this is mixed together. And so um, when Pandoc reads a document in, this is what it's represented as internally. If you look at the table, you'll see an example where on the left side we have the markdown input and on the right side the Pandoc AST that results from it. And the first two uh, rows uh, give the same result in, in the Pandoc AST even though they different. So in Markdown you can either use an asterisk or an underscore around a word or a sentence and make it to mark it as emphasized text. Um, but you can also combine those uh, in which case you have nested emphasis which in a way doesn't really make sense at least not if you nest it directly, but that's possible in, in Markdown. And you may go, okay, if it doesn't make sense, then maybe you can use it to represent small caps, for which there isn't a, 
any kind of syntax in Markdown. And of course, we could patch Pandoc and rewrite the, pa the parser and everything. But we could also say, okay, we have this AST, we want to convert it, can we do that? And we can, and we're gonna use Lua for this. Because Pandoc has a feature called Lua filters, and it allows to write some Lua code, which is then applied to the Pandoc AST. So in this example, we match on or we take all emphasis um, elements. And in this example, we check if the first element in, uh, in this emphasis is also an emphasized text. And if it is, then we take the content of the nested env element and we turn it into small caps. Uh, below you see how this works in practice. If you if you put like underscore star a word uh, star underscore into Pandoc and convert it to LaTeX, you get these nested emphasis. But if you also use the filter above, then suddenly the whole thing is turned into small caps, which is exactly what we want and. As you can imagine, this is immensely useful. So, how does all of this work? Well, first, we, we already saw uh, the languages are different, but they also have a lot in common. For example, they both allow for functional programming. Uh, Lua has functions as first-class objects. Uh, they both garbage collected, which is neat, but also leads to problems if you uh, imagine two garbage collected languages working together. But the most important point here is they both have an excellent C API. And this is what we're gonna use to link them together. And I'm gonna show you how. So let's first talk a little bit about Haskell's FFI. That's the Foreign Function Interface. And it can be used to, excuse me, to connect um, programs that are written in a different language. Of course, we need the relevant types that are present in that, that different language. And we need to get it into our runtime system. And that's what we look at now um, because we can use function imports. So uh, if we have something like a C function, uh, I'm using a Lua example here, Lua push boolean, and uh, that function takes a Lua state, which is a threat, in, like a Lua threat, and an integer representing a boolean, as you may know, C uses integers for booleans, and it returns uh, nothing, the void, the unit, basically. And we can translate that more or less directly into Haskell. Um, the, the syntax is quite simple. We just write for an import, uh, define which language, um, calling convention we're going to use. Uh, we say where the function is defined and then we give it a name. In this case, we also use Lua push boolean again. And uh, then we're going to use the types, the correct types to make sure that everything works. So we have this C int, which is a C integer. And we have PTR, which is a pointer in this case. Uh, we're cheating a little. We're using a void pointer, which can contain any kind of object. But uh, you get the idea that this is how you bind to a function. As, I, as you saw, like the, the types are not 
especially sophisticated in C. So I think that's kind of the charm of C, that it's really simple. And that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really close to the machine. Uh, but of course, in Haskell, we want our types to be very expressive and to, to make clear what they mean and represent just looking at the types we want to, be, to know what something does or something is. And we can still do this uh, in the FFI and we, because we just need our types to be instances of the storable um, type class. So if we want to, to say, okay, this integer is actually a Boolean, like a Lua Boolean, uh, we can define a new type called Lua Bool and use that instead of a C int. And we can do the same thing for uh, a stack index, which is a very important concept in, in Lua. So we can define a separate type for that. We can still use it uh, as a number, which is something we do not want for booleans, but uh, for something like a stack index, which is a number in a way we want to be able to just write one and um, instead of having to manually wrap it every time. And that way uh, we get very or quite more informative um, types and uh, type signatures for the imported functions. And this is what the Lua package does. Uh, we provide just a number of uh, bindings to normal Lua, Lua functions. And it's quite possible to use that, um, just that package. But what you happen or what happens is that you basically have to write C in Haskell. And like my personal opinion is it's not especially pretty. It's possible, but it works. But what we really want is we want the familiar feeling of using monads and everything and um, the, the code you saw before, uh, let me, ooh, that was wrong. Let me switch back. Um, where we just get some H field from somewhere. And this looks not nice in my opinion. We want it to look the way it does here. And that's, this is what uh, the H is Lua package is all about because we, um, we wrap it in a way that makes it very comfortable to use from, from Haskell. For that, um, we use certain tricks, for example, the reader monad, because the reader monad um, is more or less just a wrapper around functions that all take the same argument as um, as the first parameter. Uh, so in, in the case of Lua, all of these, these functions always get the state as the first argument. And um, because monads are so nice to use in, in Haskell, we simply write this, uh, this nice wrapper which allows us to do a very monadic um, programming style. And it's, it's still very simple in my opinion. Okay, so we have seen how um, we can bind all the functions, but what's about the data? Like we need, all the functions are useless if we can't get data from Haskell into Lua and back. And the way this works is via a stack. So Lua has a, a stack for each that. And 
if we, for example, want to call a function, we put the function onto the stack and then the arguments in order. Then we use the API function to say, okay, now call this function with three arguments and return one result and Lua will do that. And so this is how we interact with the Lua. So every time we get want to get some data onto the stack or from the stack, um, we are then actually able to, to use it with Haskell. This is very or quite simple for basic data types like numbers, booleans or strings because Lua comes with this nice API. But things get more interesting if we look at random or um, yeah, the data types we use in our Haskell application. How do we get those on the stack and back from the stack? Well, one way to do it is to use Lua tables. Lua tables are the Lua data structure. Um, there's nothing else, basically. Also, that's not true, but I will come to that. If you program in Lua, you'll be using tables a lot. And the API makes it simple to use. So we just define, uh, assuming we want to push a, a pandoc inline to the Lua stack, we tell it to create a new table, then push the text, for example, uh, that we want to, to have in the element and then set that as a field. And in the lower example, you see how that looks like or how the equivalent Lua code would look like. It's, it becomes just a table. This curly brackets uh, define a table and it has a field and the content of that field. So if you then um, access the field, we, we get the content back. That's nice and simple. Um, and it's actually what we used initially in Pandoc because there's one more thing that makes tables really nice, which are meta tables. Those meta tables can be used to define the, the behavior of a table, of an object, actually of any object in Lua. Uh, for example, if, you, if the meta table has a function, a special field, underscore, underscore, add, then this allows to overwrite or define the way the object behaves when used with the, uh, with the plus operator. So normally, if we look at this line here, this one, oops, sorry, we see that uh, using plus with a table doesn't work, like this yields an error. But if we set a meta table, then uh, we can actually use the plus operator because suddenly it's defined and it makes sense. Well, it doesn't exactly make sense in this example, but you get what I'm going for. And um, just like the add operator, there are other things you can control, like indexing, uh, accessing a field in a table can be overwritten. So in our example here, whenever a key isn't present in a table, we just return 42 instead. And you can that see that at work in this example. So um, the first field is defined, it's one. Uh, as you see, uh, Lua arrays are indexed starting at one. Well, it's a matter of taste, but I think in the Haskell world, you agree that this is not that bad. 
And uh, if we access something that doesn't exist, in this case the field hello, then we get back 42. We can control even more things like uh, the behavior when the object is garbage collected, which um, in the case of tables maybe doesn't make that much sense, but as you'll see, it's incredibly useful. So, yeah, tables are nice because they straightforward the the data structure in in Lua. They are simple, and they strict like strict evaluation. Whenever we want to push something onto the Lua stack, we have to evaluate everything. Like the whole value we are pushing has to be evaluated. Of course, that's that for ha people coming from Haskell that may feel wrong because Haskell's you are usually lazy. And especially with these huge structures that we may have in, in Pandoc where we have an AST, a com tree containing a complete document, we may be interested in just a tiny part of that tree. But often enough we have to push the whole tree onto the stack if we use tables. That doesn't seem right. So entering user data. Uh, those help to put in arbitrary data basically into Lua. They are just a container um, and that container can contain any data. Uh, but, and that the behavior of that container can be controlled by a meta table. <clears throat> so, usually those are used with pointers, but, well, pointers don't work all that well if we look at a garbage collected language, because, well, the garbage collector may move things around and then the pointer suddenly points to some memory that's no longer uh, valid and things go bad really quickly. But Haskell has a solution for that. It's called stable pointers. Those are not really pointers in the C sense uh, because they are not required to actually point to memory, but they are guaranteed that if you dereference them again, you get back the uh, the value that the pointer pointed to. So uh, this allows us to basically hide things from garbage collection and to make sure that we always keep track of an object. Of course, once we're done, we have to manually free it again, um, which may be a problem in some cases. Why? <clears throat> well, here's how we use them with user data. We just put a stable pointer into the user data and that stable pointer points to an arbitrary Haskell value, which means that we can have our lazy Haskell value and put it into the Lua or, or onto the Lua stack via this user data. Uh, here's the example code, which is quite simple to understand. I think it's um, first we create a new stable pointer and we create a new user data object, which is this Lua new user data. And it must be of the size big enough to hold this stable pointer. And then we write that stable pointer into the memory loc memory location um, that's given to us by uh, the new user data. So we, um, yeah, in the end, we have just what we wanted, the stable pointer inside a user data. But the problem is, when do we free that stable pointer again? Because we, maybe, maybe that, user data lives forever and it's enough if we um, 
if we free the pointer once the program finishes, but maybe we create a lot of them and we're not entirely sure like when they go out of scope in Lua. And happily, we have the underscore underscore GC meta method because that one allows us to run any code every time the garbage collector realizes a object is no longer used and this also works for user data so the user data is collected. For performance reasons uh, we're not writing that function in Haskell but we write it in C and I think that's one of the most amazing parts that this actually works because Haskell has like in the C API or FFI of, of Haskell, there's also a number of C functions that are defined. So we can include this HS FFI.h and then we can actually use C functions that do actions on, on Haskell data. In this case, the stable pointer. So this is the function that we are using to free the stable pointer in user data. We get the, the stable pointer out of the user data. Uh, we make sure that there is, like that we didn't make a mistake and this was called on something that is not a user data, in which case we just ignore that. But if there is a user data um, and it points to a stable pointer, then we free that stable pointer. So we can use stable pointers in Lua, which is beautiful. Now, if I was you, I'd be wondering, okay, but uh, you don't seriously expect me to know all this and write this whenever I want to combine Haskell and Lua, right? And of course not, because we wrote a lot of code to make it easy to use. Because naturally we want people to contribute to Pandoc to be able to understand the, the Haskell Lua bridge and it must be easy to use. And so this is what the, the bridge looks like in action. Um, here's some code uh, from, from Pandoc. Um, and we're gonna look at a row, like a table row, uh, which can have attributes and then a list of cells in that table row. And to, to make it usable, we just define a new type, which we call row. And we say, okay, it has a property called cells. And we also uh, add a description, which we can use when we generate documentation for this. And then we define how um, this cell property behaves. Namely, it's a list of cells. So push cell would be defined somewhere else. And this is more or less a lens. Um, so we define how the, the list of cells can be retrieved from the row object. And here below the, the same thing, but in reverse, when we get it from the stack, the row object from the stack, we define how, um, how we would set a cell, the, the cells in the row object. Um, below here, it's an action again this is how it looks like in Lua. in Lua. We can use it just like a normal table or normal object and access the, the cells property. So basically everything works as expected with the additional benefit of everything being lazy and only pushed into onto the stack if we actually need it. And if we don't need it, it's simply 
a four, uh, stable pointer. We also want to be able to use functions, which we have in Haskell, and uh, I wrote a little um, embedded DSL for that. Um, without going into too much detail, the basic idea is to expose it to, by defining the, the attributes, um, the parameters, the function gets, define how those should be retrieved or should be pushed, uh, no, should be retrieved, and then how the result should be pushed back onto the, the Lua stack. And of course, we then want to make it available to Lua, and for that we also have a nice function and we can just use that and push it to Lua. So after that, we have a function that's called row in this example, and we can use it just like a normal Haskell, uh, just like a normal Lua function, but it's actually a Haskell function. Then, uh, with all this, we also, if we use that in, in a bigger project, we still want to be able to write tests for the whole thing. And this is why HSLua also comes with a project that allows to write tests. Uh, it's very simple, so it's not super sophisticated, um, but it, for me, it's all I need. Like, we, we can write basic tests, we can group them, we have assertions uh, that we can use. And the beautiful thing is that we can integrate it into Tasty. So Tasty is this very popular Haskell framework um, that we also happen to be using in Pandoc. And we can just take complete Lua files, uh, test files, and run them and integrate them into the, the tasty output. So whenever we run a test suite, we actually also run the, the Lua tests because things should be nice and everything needs to be working together for us. So um, that's kind of handy. Also, um, since Haskell is so well known for its property tests, of course, we also support property tests. So um, whenever we want to test that something works for all integers, for example, we can do so. And you may still not be convinced and be asking like, okay, um, nice and all, but is anybody in industry actually using that? Well, first of all, we have Pandoc, which I mentioned a couple of times, and people are using Lua filters quite a lot, I think. Uh, if, you, if you check GitHub for uh, repositories that um, have the topic Pandoc and use language Lua, you get currently 41 projects, which I think is pretty good. Uh, the one with most stars is around 400 stars, so it's also quite popular. But um, there are even big companies uh, betting on that. For example, we have Quato from RStudio. Uh, RStudio is more or less um, rewriting the, the popular R Markdown toolchain using these Lua filters and I'm fairly certain they wouldn't be doing that if they didn't trust the robustness of the whole stack. So yeah, there's actual um, quite a bit in of investment into this thing. Okay, that's it. Uh, many thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about it, uh, here's a short list of links you might want to look at. I am going to upload the the um, the code for this talk 
uh, to the HS Lua website in, a, in a, just a tiny bit. So if you want to watch that again, you can find it there. And if you want to learn more about languages, you have lua.org, haskell.org. You can take a deeper look at how Pandoc uses Lua filters. And if you're interested about Quarto, then please go to quarto.org. And yeah, that is it. Thank you.